Okay, welcome to this uh, afternoon session. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, the, the speaker, which is uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce Sterling. Bruce Sterling, maybe some of you will know him as a science fiction writer, a journalist, both uh, for uh, international and uh, national media, for the stamp, but also including the newspaper where I write from. And um, uh, expert of design, expert of uh, digital uh, spaces. Uh, it's a long list of the topics that uh, interest Bruce Sterling, including the Internet of Things. I think he's going to talk exactly about this topic this afternoon. So, uh, welcome to Bruce Sterling. Welcome back to the Thanks a lot. Parts here. First, I'm going to talk about Internet of Things and show a bunch of slides and try to describe what I think is going on here. And then uh, Lorenzo Romagnoli and Yasmin Shannon, the chair, I'm going to take over in the second half and describe the uh, Casa Yasmin project here in Torino, which is kind of an attempt to do things in a practical way as opposed to this kind of theoretical or even metaphysical way that I've got to describe. I thought it would be a good idea. Well, I talk really loudly in a foreign language. Uh, am I live? Yeah. You hear me in the back of the room? The acoustics improving there. Okay, uh, slide number one. This is uh, a uh, kind of mind map of the Internet of Things, which is put together by an industry analyst named Joseph de Paolo Antonio. And Joseph de Paolo Antonio is the He's something of a visionary thinker, and I'm a visionary thinker myself because I write Fantascienza. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm quite the Joseph de Palantonio fan, and I follow his works. And this is a, a really huge chart. Of course, you can't read it, but if you look up <coughs> Joseph de Palantonio, and you can see that he's done, you know, a thing which is really as big as a city wall here. And it's basically a future vision of the Internet of Things, in which the Internet of Things is just absolutely centered to basically every aspect of industrial society. Right? The imperial vision of a dominating Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things would be like the square in the middle. And then everything else is just the client. Right? All the fuel, all the transport, all the urban infrastructure, all of engineering, all of architecture, all of manufacturing. It's all being just monitored, measured, observed, surveilled, analyzed in the corner of this thing. Uh, it's a vision of world domination by the lords of the internet who are in centralized command and control of all things, every aspect of life, measured, surveilled, automated, digitized by wireless broadband. Okay, do I believe this will actually happen? No. I mean, yes, sort of. Um, it will happen, but it will not happen all at once everywhere. And it will begin to fade away almost as fast as it continues to expand. It's part of a process which is going towards something else. And the Internet of Things is just, it's a phase in kind of general technical development of the 22nd century. Um, it's a slogan. There isn't really an Internet with a bunch of things. It's not that the Internet is lonely and needs more things in it. On the contrary, it's, it's something like automation or electrification, which are you know like real phenomena. But they don't. We don't automate absolutely everything. We don't electrify absolutely everything. And you know we just sort of forget about it. It's like if I pull my keys out of my pocket here, I don't say this is an automated key, even though it was made by a machine. And I don't say it was an electric key even though the, everything it was mined and manufactured and smelted all by electricity. We just forget that it was automated. We forget that it was electrified. And that'll be the fate of the Internet of Things, too. Once we really have an Internet of Things, it'll be invisible. It'll just be an aspect of daily life. And there will be something else happening that's kind of built on top of it, which is interesting. But this is what's interesting right now. So, you know, what is it really? Well, it's not an Internet of Things. It's more something like digital, wireless, electric, automation surveillance. I mean, that's, what, that's what's going on. But it's easier to call it Internet of 
thing. So that's what people who want to do it do it. And you might as well go ahead and call it that. I mean, and then now it goes in, whatever. It's like calling something the information superhighway. There was an information superhighway. The idea kind of went out of vogue. It was a real thing. It kind of lasted about 15 years. If you say it now, it sounds kind of stupid. And we've actually got information superhighways all over the place. We have a lot more now than we can. And we just don't talk about it that way. So, you know, given that you have this kind of theoretical overview, it's like, oh, we could master the universe with the internet. All right, how is that supposed to work exactly? I mean, the devil's in the details here. So, this is the Internet of Things, Business Landscape 3.0, done by another analyst, Matt Tour. I have to follow him, too. So he's an industry analyst, he's trying to figure out where the money and the power are going. So he's going, you know, he's just like looking on the Internet, looking at business publications, where every possible business has anything to do with the Internet of Things. You see there's all different kinds. He's broken them up into industry sectors. And like corporate guys, security guys, personal device stuff, telecom companies. When you look at this after a while, you wonder, okay, what is an Internet of Things? And the answer is, you know, basically nothing. I mean, practically anything can be Internet of Things. It's just a matter of getting your name and number and being folded into the system. So there's lots and lots, and he keeps doing a new one about every 18 months. And if you see how they develop, a lot of them, a lot of the startups just go broke and vanish because most startups go broke and vanish. And the big change has been these guys. And the end block is called corporates. And this is basically just big money and power. Big money and power. Watching people start up stuff, watching the pioneers fail. Sometimes they acquire them, sometimes they acquire them, sometimes they copy them. But you know, this is the this is the future for the Internet of Things kind of mainstream stuff and, and, and an epic struggle among these groups really to just kind of colonize everybody else. Some will survive, some may grow as, as big as this, some of these guys will be destroyed. It is an epic struggle and this is the most epic of the epic struggles. These are the majors. G-A-F-A-M, the stacks, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft. They threw Oracle in there just as a joke. Oracle doesn't really push the technology. As you can see, they exist mostly to sue people now. But they're a player because they can sue people. And you can see from this cartoon that they sort of have five different philosophies. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. They all believe the Internet of Things is coming. They just think it's going to be about them. So they spend a lot of time maneuvering, trying to steal one another's talent, trying to outcompete one another, trying to disrupt one another and trying to form various industry consortia. Because they can't do it all by themselves. I mean, they could try, and I'll try to explain a little bit about how they do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, they have to struggle. You can ask, why doesn't it just happen already? I mean, why isn't the Internet of Things already here? Well, this is, this is the problem, I and mean, this is why it's going to take a while. First, lack of interoperability or standards. Everybody in the world knows this is happening. They don't know who's going to win, so they don't know where to place their bets. Should I run Windows Embedded? Should I use Linux? Should I use Facebook's uh, acquisitions? Is it all about Amazon, Alexa? Is it about Google Nest? Works with Nest at home? Is it about the Apple at home platform? They just don't know where to put their bets, and they don't want to spend a lot of money investing in an Internet of Things application that turns out to go nowhere and just dies like Google Glass. So that's kind of problem number one. Too many players, nobody knows where to bet, so they're all hesitating. They're waiting for a shakeout. Number two, security concerns. People are really worried about being robbed or attacked. You know, and this is a new thing about the 20th T. You know, in the old internet, there was security problems, but there weren't like massive NSA style, flame, Stuxnet, heavy duty Chinese intelligence robbery, you know, just kind of. There wasn't the um, really severe and terrifying security problems that we have now. Genuine organized crime, real banditry, multi-million dollar robberies. It's really dangerous to, to just open yourself to the internet and just sort of put all your stuff on the internet. Syrian electronic army might attack you. You could be taken to the cleaners by Russian hackers. So, you know, fear is number two, and, and it's a reasonable fear. 
It's like really an insecure state. Uh, number three, uncertain return on investment. It's like, okay, I wired up my house, and now when I arrive, the lights turn on automatically as soon as I get out of my car. All right, why? Why, why didn't I just turn on the light with my finger? And why, why did I buy all this Apple hardware? Uh, okay, that's kind of flattering once, but where is the real payoff? And you know, when people don't see it, so they just don't want to spend the money. Okay, maybe I save a little energy because I've got the Google Nest thermostat, and now I've got Google in my house, and I'm going to have to worry about that. I mean, if I'm an Apple executive, do I want to put Google in my house? Probably not. Legacy equipment, okay, I've already got a stove. I've already got a refrigerator. I've already got a car. Why do I need a connected stove, a connected refrigerator, a connected car? I mean, I've got them, and they're working fine. And they're like made by major guys, so why, am I, why are you asking me to throw away all my old-fashioned, unconnected, dumb electric hardware? I mean, why do I have to take that trouble? That's my legacy equipment, the install base. Technological immaturity, okay, I bought the thing, it doesn't really work. It was the alpha rollout, kind of sucks, why did I do this? Privacy concerns, all right, yeah, I put Google Nest on the wall, now Larry and Sergey are data mining everything I do, and I really want to do that. Do I really want Facebook to run my house, or worse yet, my industry? And, uh, you know, like, I don't know how to do it. There aren't enough young kids around to know what to do. And, you know, maybe so everybody will be broke and we'll all be unemployed, but who cares? So, you know, this, this is kind of the basic reason people don't do it. And this is how they're actually trying to do it. And there's a lot of different ways. And they're all in competition with one another. Zigbee, Six Low Band, C Wave, Sigbox, Thread. Okay, if you've got Zigbee, you can kind of use it with Thread. But if you've got Z Wave, you can't use it with Six Low Band. If you've got Six Low Band, Bluetooth Low Energy is your enemy. One M to M is for engineers. Nobody else knows what to do with it. It's all machine to machine stuff, GPRS. I don't know what that is. It's like a cell phone thing, LTE. Who cares? 5G. People don't even know what 5G is. Like, where's the 5G? I have 4G. I have 4.5G. Okay, it's like a tremendous mess. Really a tremendous mess. And this is just a way to move stuff around. It's just moving wireless signals. I mean, here's for the engineers in the audience. They're like really getting down to the nutcracker problem here. All the possible communication technologies and use the Internet of Things. Like a Chinese menu here. There's no end to it. And it's just going on and on and on. And they all have, you know, they all have like different ways of working. Uh, you know, so what are the problems here? Well, I mean, there's like five, there's, there's all these different kinds of broadband, but they all have different kinds of power, different ranges, and different speed. And that's really the problem. Okay, you got a really powerful one, then it eats up all the batteries, so you have to plug it into the wall. But if you plug it into the wall, then it's not mobile, and you can't take it around. Okay, if it's mobile, then it can't be very powerful. It just blows out your battery, and then you're not on the net anymore. Or you can use practically no power at all, but then you can't really send signals back and forth. It's just sort of sitting there waiting for a signal. It's like a little sensor. So you can't just put everything on the internet and have everything use TCP IP, because that's kind of a notorious power hog. I mean, Wi-Fi, very power hungry. Z-Wave is a low power mesh network, but then you never know which Z-Wave thing is talking to the other one, because they're they're on a mesh instead of a network. Also, it's not open because it's actually owned by Sigma Designs. And it runs on the 900 megahertz network, which has got its own technical problems. Because the higher the bandwidth, you know, the, the harder it is to get to a wall. If you want to communicate through walls, you have to choose something else. Then there's Zigbee, it's another low power mesh. It is open, but it's not GPL open which is enough to make some people upset. It's on the 2.5 megahertz broadband. It can't connect to the internet very well. So it's not really an internet of things program at all, even though it's, then there's Thread, which was just acquired by Google. And everybody fears Google, so they kind of like to use Thread, because it kind of makes sense. But on the other hand, if you use Thread, you have to like kiss up to the chocolate factory, as they like to call Google. You know, and the chocolate factory is scary, because they've got a lot of money and they're kind of nuts. Then there's Bluetooth, which sounds like it ought to work, but it doesn't really go that far. And if you've ever used Bluetooth, you know it's patchy, you know, walk behind the wall and you lose the signal. And then they change it to Bluetooth LE, which doesn't interact with Bluetooth.
Bluetooth. And then there's like smart Bluetooth, which doesn't really talk to other Bluetooth or Bluetooth that way. So you've got like three different kinds of Bluetooth, none of which work very well. And then there's the alien stuff. UDP, MQTT, XMPP, COAP, Modbus, and of course the beloved HTTP, which everybody gets to see. Okay, these things have been used in engineering for a long time, they're used for industrial control, they're used in offshore oil mining rigs, or used in chemical factories, they're very well established, they just have nothing to do with the internet. They're old-fashioned industrial digital command control systems. They're secure, they're pretty well established, nobody but guys with hard hats knows anything about using them. <coughs> so it's just, it's an epic struggle. I mean, it's really a Donnie book here. And there are many, many ways that you can cleverly use this to like screw an industrial competitor or get some kind of industrial advantage. I mean, in many ways, this is the battlefield. But that's not all of it. Because inside the devices, there's also a struggle. When you think you just plug the thing in, it's like, did it arrive on the internet or did it not? No, it's not a black box. If you're an engineer, if you're an engineer, it's like you have to worry about all the electronic components inside the box. And then you have to like draw little lines around it. Okay, this is the part we're going to make open. But we can't make this other stuff open because we'll get sued. So we've kind of agreed that the red dot area is the place where we're going to be open. Some of us will be open, and others of us won't. And then we have all these other transport guys that have to worry about. Bluetooth, Bluetooth LD, Wi-Fi Red, Cloud Stuff, Z-Wave, Zigbee, right? And every one of these components is a little battlefield. Like, I can mess up your security. Or like, you have to use my device management. And I think it's better than yours. Or I've got a discovery algorithm that's going to be better than your discovery algorithm. So, you know, from a, from a consumer point of view, it seems kind of simple. I plug it into my Apple machine, it just works. But the actual nature of the enterprise, it's quite complicated. It's a very difficult matter. So now let's assume you're an architect. You're like, oh yeah, Internet of Things, that sounds great. I know my rich patron will pay me to build a skyscraper and run on the Internet of Things. All I have to do is figure out what's going on and kind of like find the suppliers and package it and everybody will be happy. Okay, instant protocol soup. This is a building like your campus here. Just say, we want to put the Polytechnical on the Internet of Things. That'll be great. Okay. What aspect of a polytechnic? Is it your water? Is it your electrical? Is it your entry systems? Is it security? Is it Wi-Fi that you need? What kind of Wi-Fi? Is it the elevators? They're all being run on different systems. Video surveillance cams. You got protocol soup in the building. I mean, you're the architect. You're supposed to sign off on it. It's like, yeah, it's going to work now, sir. Give us the money. We've got to go build something else. No, you've actually got you know, like a subway roadmap of possible interventions you can do. Quite spooky. Now suppose you're not an architect. Let's say you're a Torino smart city urban planner. You're like, oh yeah, we need like a smart town here. We're to like do a lot of Internet of Things stuff in the town. What kind of stuff are you going to do in the town? All this health care, public services, smart buildings, smart homes, transport utilities, etc. Other. All right, so you know, here I am, I'm supposed to like talk to the mayor of Torino. It's like, sir, we've got some money and we decided to like upgrade some of our services. They're like, wait, which ones? Traffic, lights, water? They don't actually interoperate. I mean, what does public health services actually have to do with like smart bicycles? I mean, what, what actual commonalities do they have? I mean, why, why are healthcare and bicycles have anything to do with one another? Well, they're kind of famous smart city or internet of things applications. But you just don't know. I mean, you're required to do this. If you're like a smart city guy, and you'll meet other smart city guys, you're going to talk in exactly this way. It's like, yes, healthcare, bicycles, public services, building smart home, and transportation. And suddenly you're supposed to be some kind of expert on all these subjects. Just because, you know, you're one of the masters of the internet of things or the master of smart city initiatives. But it's actually quite a difficult matter. I mean, it is protocol soup. They don't work alike. They don't act alike. There is warfare inside the boxes. There are many different choices of communication technology that don't actually work. Lots. And yet suddenly you're supposed to go to the voters and say, well, you know, let's go modernize. 
all right, whose problem is that? Well, it's probably your problem in this room. And if you like graduate, and somebody says, oh, well, you know, you're from the Polytechnic, you must have a great technical education. Tell us all about smart cities. Hey, well, good luck with that. And there's like, I mean, there's five different ways, and there's sort of five paradigms of the Internet of Things. And they're all, they all quarrel with one another. That's thing-centric. Like, I'm just going to make everything have a number, like this book is on the thing, this guy is on the thing, this object is an Internet of Things object. But there's the gateway-centric version, like actually there's a router over there, a router on the wall, and it's responsible for kind of taking care of everything. Like, is that what the internet thing is? And the rest of these are just kind of little dome sensor things. Or it's smart zone centric, like this guy here. Like, you know, it's in my pocket. So, you know, I, I actually just sort of pull up an app, and that's where the internet of things is. And I've kind of got like my strap device here. So, you know, if I'm like really in love with my object here, I can, I can take my Apple device and I can kind of put it into my Nike wearable patch. And then I can like strap my Nike wearable patch onto my arm here. So, you know, heaven forbid I should ever be off the internet of things. Yes, it's itchy. Yes, it's stretchy. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to do. I've been messing with it for a long time. I'm kind of worried about Nike. They're very into internet of things and yet they just make clothing. They've got a lot of ex-Apple guys in the internet of things, so I pay a lot of attention to Nike and their suffering. And I try to help them understand what they're doing. And I believe it's about this comfortable. <laughs> well, you know, I could like I could put this thing on sort of kinda of, under some circumstances at work. And I've got like my other little sideboard plug here, two or three of them. So now I've got like my wearable microphone and I've also got my wearable earplugs and I've got my wearable this and I've got my wearable that and it starts to get pretty complicated. But you know, automation was complicated too. I mean, this, this is just a laundry instruction. You know? And, and, and when you look at it, you know, it's like if you don't know anything about washing the laundry, it's like it really is kind of like intimidating. And even crazy, you know, like housewives do this every day. You know, this is like the label that's on top of an automatic electric washing machine. Right? You just say, okay, my mom sent me to college and I know I have to wash my own clothes. Like, what the hell? You know, laundry is stupid. What? What? That makes no sense. You know, the hell? and I just kind of get used to it. And this the handheld thing is kind of a problem. And so, I used to write science fiction about it. I imagined it before it existed. 
but you know, it's now it's actually a present day day in all its all its gorgeous complexity. You well, know, here it is, and it's just that's what it's like. Uh, the smart house is already infested with processes. So you know, what are you supposed to do about this? Well, there's a recent design manifesto by some guys up in Berlin, and we call things cons. They're like, they're all designers. They're like scratching their heads over it. And they're like, what can we do with these new technical capacities? Why, we're ethical designers. We should make sure not to harm mankind. They all got together, about a dozen of these guys, and they came up with like this ethical declaration. It's like, let's be good. And I was like, do it the good way. Like, we're gonna like decide what we're gonna do. Okay, first we don't believe the high. That's good. You know, it's like. We actually understand that it's just the Internet of Things is not a thing. It's actually all these competing protocols and all these competing infrastructures and all these different kinds of guys and gigantic consortia and vicious power struggles between multi billion dollar companies. And okay, you know, so it's not going to be perfect, it's not going to be smooth, but you know, at least we can do something. We'll make things that are useful, we'll like try to do things that make everybody happy. But I try to keep the criminals away from the door. Like I try to respect human privacy. We won't just soup up all the data. We'll like really kind of think about what we're doing here. Uh, well, we'll, but we'll try not to sneak in it and hide or anything. And we'll like let the user be the guy who makes the decisions. And we'll make good, solid, long-lasting products. And really thoughtful. And we'll be kind of humanistic about it all. Okay, I really enjoyed this. I mean, I'm always happy to see an ethical declaration. If you actually really want to understand what's going to happen, just go ahead and apply some cynical real politics to this. Right? And just like everything that they do and assume the exact opposite. Everybody will believe the hype. Yes, many people will just fall for it completely. It's like, yeah, Internet of Things, give me a kilo of it. Come on. Will they be useful? No, a lot of them are going to be rubbish, they're kind of difficult, they don't really work, they hurt people, they fall off, they break, they're stupid, they're out for roll out, they're no damn good, we aim for the win, win, win. Now I'm going to cheat you, I'm going to take all the money from you that I can, I'm going to delight, delight, quibble, I'm going to rob you, I'm going to use finance to like take you to the cleaners. We're going to keep everyone and everything secure. And how the security? I don't care if your house gets robbed. I'm going to make cheap locks. I'm going to use cruddy stuff. Security is too much work. I don't care. I'm going to use any open thing that I can. I'm going to steal stuff from you that I can. I'm going to hire people to spy on you. The Israelis are my friends. I love the NSA. If I'm the Germans, I'm going to collaborate with the NSA. I'm going to spy on Italy, France, Brussels, anybody I can spy on. I'm going to make all this noise in public about how I'm protecting the public. I'm going to surveil the public every time I can. We get the police to spy on everybody. We build and promote a culture of privacy. What culture of privacy? My privacy, not your privacy. <laughs> you should be transparent. I should be private. I want to know every single thing you do. If I get any advantage at all, I'm going like, to use the Internet of Things to figure out everything. I'm going to sell you stuff with that attack you with it, embarrass you with it, I'm going to flame you on Facebook. We're deliberate about what data we collect. Why? i got tons of data. Give me all the data. Give me every possible piece of data. i got the Amazon Cloud. I have infinite storage on Flickr. I'll just save everything. Why should I ever erase anything? We make the parties associated with an IoT product explicit. Why? I work for a cigarette company. Why should you ever know? We sell liquor. I'm an arms dealer. I don't want you to know what I'm doing. I'm an offshore banker guy. I'm a Russian mogul. Why should I tell you what I'm doing? We empower users. Why empower the users? The less they know, the better you are. You think Facebook wants to empower you? Does Google want you to be more powerful? Does Apple want you to make decisions about Apple's products? No. We design things for their lifetime. What is the lifetime of a handheld device? 18 months. 18 months. And this is the biggest, you know, the most successful technological object in history. It lasts 18 months. It doesn't last 18 years. It doesn't last 180 years. It lasts 18 months. Nobody's going to make any cell phones that last longer than that. You go broke. You ever see a bronze cell phone? Nobody's going to make a bronze cell phone. The components break. They fall apart. 
And in the end, we are human beings. Well, you know, some of us. It's more like we're temporarily human beings. We were like dead for a long, long time. So, you know, why should I care? In the long run, we're all dead, and I'm just going to do whatever I can to get ahead, all right? Like, dog, it's dog, man against man, man against dog. All right, so, you know, it's important to maintain a sense of humor about this. I mean, it actually is funny. I mean, it's an epic struggle, but it's also a comic struggle. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just inherently hilarious that we would want to do this to ourselves. You know? It's like we've been messing with computers for like 40 years. We know what's wrong with them. Everybody in this room knows how badly computers behave. And now we want to export computation into every physical object around us. Every bar of soap, every light switch, every speed pedal, every faucet. We really want to do that? Yeah, we do. We really, really want to do it. We're like burning with eagerness to do it. You know, nothing's going to stop us. We're going to trample all hesitation in our path. We're like, try to escape, my darling. Oh my God, the doors are automatically locked. All right, it is funny. Um, it is just a phase. It's something that's, you know, probably last about 15 years. Take about 30 years to get here. Um, it contains the seeds of its own obsolescence. People are going to come up with like actual ways to do this, and ways to do things that are kind of make more sense. Um, but, you know, at least it's a chance to make new mistakes. I mean, it actually does disrupt the 20th century's industrial order. You know, and in some ways, this this uh, you know, maniacal scheme here really is a, a, a lesson of hope. Because it, it is such so saying that we could take command over these other things that we built, you know, the automation, the plant, the fossil fuels, the, maybe some of the weaponry, that we can manage them better, that we have like an opportunity to understand what we're doing to ourselves. We can learn things about ourselves faster. You know, we can repair some of the damage we've already done. We can like get better informed about the decisions we're trying to make. You have to have some trust in human nature in order to even get out of bed in the morning. I mean, we do a lot of this to ourselves, obviously, but, you know, we've got to go with something. Uh, you know, we have good intentions, but, you know, we have bad practices. What the heck? We are human beings. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm, like, very involved in this. Uh, you, can, you can understand the future. It's been easy to kind of forecast this. The exact way it's working out is really interesting. I and mean, I'll show you some books if you want to look at them. If you're an architect, I would urge you to read this, SQM, The Quantified Home. Came out a couple of months ago. A series of uh, essays from Space Caviar out of Genova. Kind of a European architecture theory book about what it might be like to, at all, work on a radical, radical new version of a kind of electronic or surveilled home. This book hasn't arrived yet, it's just about to come out with designing connected products. If you're into industrial design and kind of interested in how connected products might particularly work and sort of, sort of the kind of technical and engineering problems, and also just the sort of human interface problems, this book's really pretty good. And it's the, about the best I've seen on the subject. Uh, you know, and it has many, many different chapters on many of the, um, you know, the kind of basic, very basic challenges involved in this. Um, so, you know, it, it's good to know that. If you, um, there was a little project at the uh, Salon del Mobile this year called Ram House, Radar Absorbent Materials House, which was about building a house that kind of assures privacy by other methods. That, that was an interesting experiment. There were a lot of similar experiments of that kind. I, Spent a lot of time listening to them. Um, if you want, want to follow the kind of study that I myself are doing, I have a uh, tumbler set, which is called Wolf in the Living Room, where I just sort of collect data on the Internet of Things and kind of speculations about it. And I sort of provide links to thinkers and people who are speculating about it. You know, it really is an epic struggle, it's something that's going to like go on for the rest of my lifetime. Um, you know, it'll become old-fashioned someday in the way that the information superhighway is old-fashioned. But right now, it's sort of red hot. So, um, you know, you can understand the future, but you can only act in the moment. And uh, this is the moment in which to pay attention to this.
Uh, if you're somebody who's like into trans and you'd like to understand something before it comes mainstream, it's just a, a very good time to be involved in the Internet of Things, and that's why Lorenzo and, uh, and Yasmina and I are in fact very involved in it. And I'll tell you some more uh, later. So, thanks for your attention.
which is, you know, kind of an open source consortium, and it's got sort of a zillion guys in it. Qualcomm, Cisco, Microsoft, Sony, LG, Panasonic, Sharp, Netgear, VeriSign. So you've got a bunch of old school internet companies, some Japanese electronics guys, a few Korean guys. But Intel is not there, and except for Microsoft, none of the big internet players are there. Apple's not a member, Facebook's not a member, Amazon doesn't care, and so forth. Then there's the Open Interconnect Consortium. And they all call themselves open, but they're only open to the guys in the consortium. Actually. They're kind of standard sports, but they're, they're all trying to build standards and make themselves look better. The, Apple, the Open Interconnect Consortium is Intel, Samsung, Broadcom, Atmel, Cisco, General Electric, and some other guys. So if you're General Electric, you're in both the Industrial Internet Consortium and the Open Interconnect Consortium, Open Interconnect Consortium which sounds kind of great, except that you realize that these two consortia don't have the same things. Now you've got like a civil war in your own company. Right? It's like, oh yeah, I just came from the OIC meeting and we've agreed to do this, that, and the other. But wait a minute, I was just at the IIC meeting. And we said we would do this, that, and the other. So now you have to like start shooting your own personnel. And then there's the IPSO Alliance, which is um, IP smart objects. I'm actually trying to put objects onto the internet. That would be ARM, Ericsson, Atmel, and Google. So you've got some like Europeans there, like Ericsson's Europeans. That sounds kind of great, except now you've got the chocolate factory there, Google. And Google's got so much more money than everybody else. It's just it's a feeling they're going to like drag them around by the ear. So that's a little bit scary. And then there's Apple. And of course, Apple never tells anybody anything. But even Apple needs alliances. So in order to do the Apple at home thing, they've dragged in Broadcom, Philips, Honeywell, Belcom, Marvel Technologies, and Withings. Plus, they're acquiring people. I mean, all these guys are acquiring people. They're just buying stuff outright. And then there's Google, which has works with Nest because they bought Nest. They just acquired them. And they've like Jawbone, Whirlpool, LFX, Daimler, Mercedes Benz, the Google car. So they're sort of practicing on replacing everybody's dashboard with an Android, which is like weird if you think about it. Like, why does Fiat even have a dashboard? Why doesn't Fiat just give up and put this as the dashboard and let Google run it? But if Fiat does that, what's left of Fiat? Aren't they just a hardware manufacturer for Google at that point? And that's the scale of the struggle. Android and everything. They want to put Android in everything. And they might, because there's a lot of Android around. And then there's Amazon. And they never talk to anybody either, but they've got the Amazon Lab 126, which is where Alexa and the Dash button came from. The Dash button is the thing where you just put it on the wall and push it if somebody brings in soap. As like the Amazon version of the Internet of Things. And then there's the Chinese, Xiaomi and Huawei. And the Xiaomi Light OS and the, Xiao and the Xiaomi Internet of Things services, which are coming on very fast. And they're basically selling to everybody who isn't Europe or the US, which is a lot of people, a whole lot of people, like Indians, Africans, Malaysians, Indonesians. They're quite keen on Xiaomi stuff. Like, okay, you buy a Xiaomi product, Chinese intelligence will spy on you. But that's probably better than being spied on by the NSA, because Chinese can't really do anything much to it. So maybe you just might be a better, better decision there. Right? So, you know, there's a great deal of Machiavellian intrigue going on in there, and people are sort of laying chips all over the board. Intel is basically in every consortium. GE has been doing some very clever things. Cisco has been an extremely able group diplomatically in messing with this. So, you know, it's, it's just, it, is a, it is a power struggle, and it's kind of a fascinating power struggle. And it's hard to say who would win, but definitely the odds are going to be fastest of the uh, richest. The odds are not. I mean, I mean, what's interesting about this is that there actually is consolidation among the big five now. And it, it used to be that Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft were very different, and they offered very different things. I mean, one was a search engine company, and one was an OS company, and one was a hardware company, and one just sold social media. But they've all moved laterally into one another's areas, so that 
you know, Facebook has an app, and Microsoft has apps, Microsoft has abandoned its own phone service, and now they're like adapting to Android, trying to work, doing a lot of open source stuff. So, you know, there, there actually is some industry consolidation here as mature internet companies. They actually tend to look rather alike. I mean, you can use Apple social media, you can use Microsoft social media, etc., etc. The one area where they're really kind of differentiating, where things do seem kind of weird, is in this kind of Internet of Things aspect. Because nobody knows how that works yet. I mean, nobody, nobody really knows. <coughs> it, it, it offers them, while they're copying one another on the Internet, it offers them a chance to outflank one another by suddenly moving into these blue ocean territories where nobody knows where the money is going to go. Um, you, know, you see them trying a lot. I mean, that's what the Google moon shots are about. That's why the Amazon Lab 126 stuff is coming from. I mean, Google's doing weirder stuff than anybody else, but being the first guy to do it isn't necessarily what's going to win. Microsoft tends to do it third or fourth, but they just crush you with relentless focus. You know, Apple will like wash it in unicorn tears and take all the money out of the market. Now, Facebook will spy on you relentlessly, you know, and, and Amazon will just cut your legs out from under you. So, you know, it's, it's a massive struggle. You know? and, um, I feel I understand Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple pretty well. Like, they don't surprise me that much except for Google. So the people who really alarm me are the Chinese. And I think there's, there's a good chance. If there, there's a dark horse in that race, it's probably Xiaomi or Huawei. Why do you say that? Well, because they were the dark horse in a lot of other electronics races. I mean, they cut the legs and from the Japanese electronics business. They're like undercutting the Korean electronics business. They're very capable competitors. They seem to know very well what they're doing. And they also, they just don't have the, you know, limitations of, what do you call it? Anglo-American neoliberal capitalism. They just don't behave under that, under those structures. So, you know, I mean, they don't compete the way these other guys compete. They just spy on you and then undercut you, and then they retreat to the middle of the team, and you can't do anything against them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they are a superpower. They're, they're, they're a coming superpower. I mean, Russia, the Russians aren't going to do anything. They've got free content. But they're not, they're not, you won't see a Russian Internet of Things that amounts to anything. But an Internet of Things with Chinese characteristics, that could happen really easily. And you know, what, how would I know it was winning? You know, I would know it was winning if you went into like a Chinese district of the town and you saw everybody using Huawei. That would be really interesting. Right? It's kind of one of the big smart city problems. Like what happens if somebody moves into your city and starts using a foreign operating system? I mean, it's the Uber problem. What happens if you're Torino and you're making a lot of money off Torino's taxis? Because they're basically taxed very heavily. It's like a great way to get foreigners to pay for your city services. But then what happens when somebody shows up with a handheld device and they don't go into the hotels and they don't use the taxis? They just live in an Airbnb and they use Uber. Where does Torino's streaming go? I mean, where did the money go? You get like disintermediated and kind of kicked to the curb. So you know, it's, it's dangerous to ignore this kind of stuff. It actually could lead to like a fiscal crisis. You could end up as a tourist city swarming with tourists who never pay you anything. And that's, you know, that's the Venetian disease, right? You'd end up like Venezia at that point. Everything just gets hollowed out and taken over. Yes, it is. Yeah. There is a potential weakness in the development to this uh, huge complex uh, mess you described that you alluded to, which is that temporarily it looks like it depends on the willingness of human beings to buy or support the, uh, 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 the development of things, right. uh, which is of course uh, uh, worrying considering all the other aspects of uncertainty. So this could go in many very different ways. You could imagine a kind of Luddist scenario 
people saying just we don't want any of this crap, we, right. we're going to destroy it. Better. You could imagine a considerate scenario where the three billion visitors of uh, Tata Yasmina agree to to call to to delineate in this mess uh, the acceptable part of it and, and produce it. And then unfortunately you can also imagine two other scenarios where one where Basically, uh, some of the industry there would succeed in doing what the financial industry has, has uh, succeeded to do, that is basically deciding that money will produce more money without any interference of human beings. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and there they would, they would just get you know, objects to decide that uh, uh, one will buy more objects simply because you. Uh, if you don't, it doesn't work anymore, or whatever. Or you can imagine another scenario, uh, and the two can be combined, where simply human beings themselves will be turned in, in, uh, in objects. In Paris. I think there is a graffiti on the wall of the backside of, of the saying, I, uh, I, I, treat, uh, I treat you human beings as if they were objects. I believe this was probably done by an engineer, an anarchist engineer, a student. Uh, so, uh, so, what are, I mean, probably you can guess 10 of the scenarios, because, uh, but uh, how do you see the chance of uh, the second one uh, uh, being, uh, let's say, uh, let's say at least exerting some uh, uh, some action on our future. Well, you know, there's a lot of possible change drivers here, and you kind of generate scenarios at all times. And it's kind of, you know, I think what happens here is that all scenarios happen at once. But sometimes they just happen to a tiny fraction of people. Yeah. Like there's a tiny fraction of people right now whose homes really are automated. And uh, there have always been some. I mean, Domotica is an old idea. It's been around in Italian interior design since the 80s. Domotica. Uh, so, you know, it might be that case. I mean, there, just, there might be like a lot of Internet of Things, but only in very small, heavily policed areas. Or else you might come up and sort of become a general thing. Um, you know, I've heard the same arguments made over and over again, and I, I like to think in terms of, uh, you know, historical analogy. So I, I like to compare the Internet of Things to automation and to electrification. You say, okay, there was a time we said everything has to be electrical. And yeah, you know, pretty much everything is electrical. We got electric electric. But we don't have like an electric belt or electric shoes. There was, a, you know, there was a period where it sort of reached a, an area that quit. And I think, I, you know, I, I think it will spread, and it will spread for about 50 years, and then it'll become old hat, and then it'll be replaced by something else. Uh, you know, which interests me a lot. I mean, what comes after an Internet of Things? It's like, I think, a, a really interesting science fictional question. Uh, and I think it's something called augmented ubiquity, but I don't really know how to describe it very well. I think that's probably where I'll, where I'll die. I mean, if I'm lucky, I'll outlive the Internet of Things the way I outlive the information superhighway. And I'm pretty sure I'll outlive the personal computer, which is really kind of a great historical privilege. I mean, it's fun, it's fun to think of a personal computer going away and that all computers are now social. They're all connected. To the net. You don't really see an unconnected computer that just belongs to one person. But that was the idea. Because like, you know, computers were all connected at one point because they had to have, it took a whole corporation to own one. And so why don't we let the individual have one? And then we ended up with this thing that made a very non individual world. It's just like now it's just a portable communication device. It's very small, but it's connected to everybody. So you know, I think I've outlived the disconnected computer. That's kind of a good scenario. I mean, to do a scenario, you have to imagine it dying. It's like, how long will it last? And I think this particular phone lasts about 15 years. Just, you know. I mean, people, it, it'll still be around, but people just won't talk about it. They don't talk about automating and stuff. No, they don't talk about electrifying. Well, I'll, I'll build you a house, yeah? And shall I electrify your house? <laughs> like, no, of course you're going to electrify my house. Now, I can possibly do um, and it'll be, I'll build you a house. Shall it be a smart one? No, it's just going to be whatever there is. Right? So, I mean, that, that's a scenario. And, 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 and to be that, like, 
I mean, if this were like something going on forever, this would be like George Orwell, just a woman stabbing herself again and again. If you think of this as something that only lasts 15 years, it's kind of like bloody but comical. <laughs> a black humor period where people were like, you know, so hopeless they were blowing themselves up. I mean, this obviously doesn't last very long. And in the final analysis, it's just some kind of horror game. It's just like a passing thing, kind of like appeared and was weird for a while and then, and then went away. So, you know, I, I think that's what's going to happen. That's why I find it quite funny. I mean, this is fun. Yes. I mean, this is very funny. I mean, this is like the human reaction to intolerable levels of complexity. I mean, just, you know, you thought, I just wanted to wash my underwear because it smells. And you're like, you're in there and you're like, how did my mom ever do this? <coughs> okay, yeah, this is sort of what we're looking at. But, you know, not forever. I mean, in some ways, it would be great if Google would do this for you. You know? I mean, why don't you just like show Google this and then show Google the underwear and it just like sets the clock, sets the washer for you, and then you throw it in and everything's fine. I and mean, wouldn't that sort of be great? <coughs> and you can imagine Apple Siri doing that. Like, you just show Apple Siri this, it doesn't mean pinks, it means something else, you know. I mean, Siri would know. Right? Google goggles. Google goggles would know. You could take a picture with your head mounted display and be like, oh yeah, that means nylon. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. You know, it's great. I like the symbol. Now I can have a thousand symbols instead of these symbols I had to memorize. A different world. I mean, I do scenarios actually, but I am a fan of Shinza writer, so I, I visited this place in, uh, in Milano, which was put together by Space Caviar, and I just now wrote a science fiction story which is set in one of these future private homes. So, you know, it's useful to me as a novel to kind of keep up with this. It was, it was actually a really good setting, you know, it's just kind of off the grid privacy mansion in, uh, in Sardinia where a millionaire is hiding from the public. He just doesn't want to be on the internet of things. He just wants to do drugs and have virtues and be left alone. Now, it, it turned out to be quite inspirational, so it's, it's, it's useful, it's in a rare way. Any questions uh, besides the Philippe's second question? I have one more, which is uh, uh, regarding net neutrality. Net neutrality, just to be everybody on, on the same page, net neutrality is the principle according to which internet service provider cannot discriminate data flows on the internet. So more or less all data flows are treated equally. But typically we think of net neutrality um, in regards to human beings accessing the internet. Therefore, if, they, if net neutrality is respected, you you do not uh, uh, worry that your internet service provider is messing with internet flows and slowing down certain applications or certain websites. Now, coming to the Internet of Things, uh, people are starting to talk about net neutrality and Internet of Things. Uh, do you care to comment about that? I don't think it's going to work because uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, that, well, the networks are not, I mean, look at these. I mean, very few of these are actually TCP IP. Oh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of internet there's a lot of networks on the internet of things, quite unquote. They just aren't internet. So you know, you have net neutrality in the internet, and these devices would just never show up. In a lot of cases, you're well advised to keep the devices off the internet. You really want to try the gateway model and kind of like put a firewall there, and just you know, so that the Russians don't come in and like turn your stove into a you know virus spreading machine. Uh, and I think the players, too, are perfectly aware of net neutrality, and if they see any possible advantage in violating it or finding some method to go around it or under it, of course they will. And, you know, that's why Google has got bought its own pipes, and that's why Google set up Google Moon, and that's why Facebook has set up internet.org, and they're like, coming up with all these schemes to spread connectivity without having to play by the internet's rules. Um, you know, it's embraced and extend, and I think that our big players here, some of which are predate the internet, are quite cynical about it. I mean, they, they call themselves internet companies, but each one of them thinks of the internet as just, you know, a frontier or a pasture that they can exploit for their own 
business and power advantages. Um, you know, while there, there's a lot of sentiment in favor of net neutrality, there's also just a lot of fear about a neutral internet. And it's this, you know, security concerns number two. If you've got net neutrality, you don't really have a way to keep the Chinese out of your kitchen. You can't, you know, you can't keep the Israelis from hitting Kaspersky, trying to spy on them or knock them over. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the truly neutral and universal internet is fearful and, you know, increasingly frightening. And, you know, in an area for terror and cyber war and large-scale theft and, you know, industrial-scale fraud. So, you know, security concerns are a big deal with the internet of things. And also, if you put things on the internet, you always bring in local ordinances. Because, you know, a thing is a physical thing. It's not like a piece of code. It's actually a real thing. So I can't really say that I want net neutrality for the mole and the Miliana. I mean, the, the mole belongs to Torino. It belongs to Piemonte. It doesn't really belong to the internet. I didn't know it's a thing. So you know, I think you're going to see a lot of proper care and law moving in the Internet of Things situation pretty quickly. And um, you know, I think you could have, you might end up with a situation where you have an Internet of Things which is mostly wholly owned by the big players. These guys have all the rights. And you could have a legacy Internet which is owned by scientists and the academy and non-profit guys the way it was in the 70s. And they're just kind of left alone in this old-fashioned way. It's like, oh, sure, go ahead, trade software. Uh, Goldman Sachs doesn't care if you raise chickens. Go ahead, professor, you know, enjoy all the bandwidth you can eat. You're going to be over here doing something else. Which would be fine with me. I, mean, I remember the pre-dot-com internet very fondly. You could have an internet that had no money in it and all the money could have gone into the internet of things. That seems like a scenario would be possible. Uh, would, would you care to comment on the last slide then, or the DVD factor slide, you know, the slide before the, the bars, the, the one you had before? Uh, the, you know, the fact that for security concerns, uh, it's extremely high. Uh, societal concerns are devastatingly low, uh, even though uh, it's a, let's say it's unclear that societal dislocation would not be at all a delaying uh, uh, factor. Right. And, uh, uh, is it just a measure of the short sightedness of the, uh, the people who were asked? No, yeah, it's that. I mean, the people who are asked are all business people. This is what's inhibiting business from adopting the industrial internet. Okay, business is not going to be held down for a minute by societal concerns. I mean, the, the, the designers care about this. All this. There are any business guys who care about that. Not at all. They just don't give a damn. But they're very afraid of being wrong. And for good reason. And, you know, if you're a business and I mean, you can get like a point of sale fraud now to like wipe out your board of directors. Somebody can come in and just hack your payment system, run off a hundred million dollars, fifty million dollars of internet fraud, and man, you're done. It's really bad. And they're also really, really concerned about industrial espionage now. They're very afraid that the Chinese will show up, advance persistent threat, copy your entire data bank, and then just like take over whatever you manufacture and try and get out of business. It'll be Nortel Networks. So yeah, they're, they're serious. There are serious concerns. And if I was a business guy, I think I'd feel exactly the same way. I mean, this is a reasonable response from the chief executive officer and the board of directors. And this, you know, I mean, not everybody who's in business worries about this, but you know, if you are, yeah. And this is why they're not doing it right now. I mean, these are reasonable responses. They're not crazy, weird, short-sighted. They're just about the money. They're about the money. Okay, any questions? If not, let's thank you again, Bruce, for this.